Hi, everybody. I'm Teresa Richwine. I'm the Director of Website Resources from the Website and Multimedia Resources Department. We manage anything that has to do with the public facing www.hack.edu, as well as a handful of some online software applications and all the photography and videography for the college. I'm a Hack alum, and I've been here for almost 12 years. Thank you, Teresa. Denise. <laughs> Thank you, boss. Hi. Hi. Liney was cheering. Yes. I'm Denise chair. Pfeiffer. I am the business director over in workforce development. And some of my major responsibilities, the, one of the main ones, is to make sure that our department is fiscally strong and stable. Um, so I focus on our budget pretty much, making sure that our revenue and expenses are in line with what we've said. Um, I make sure that we are staffed adequately, enough to handle the training that comes our way, as well as our duties that are associated with the college, getting things done for the college, and making sure that our training is priced appropriately, um, so that our students receive training at a reasonable price, that it's what the market will bear, um, and that um, overall our department is profitable in the end. And I've been with HACK for three years. This Friday it will be. Oh, oh great Thank you. <laughs> great. Christine. Hello, I'm Christine Noak, Chair of English, celebrating five years at HACK this Halloween, mm -hmm. but one year in my current position as the Chair of English. My name is Lori Freelander. I'm the Technical Director for the Performing Artist Series at the Rose Island Art Center. And I'm also adjunct faculty for the theater department, so I get to cross over and work with students as well. Um, I've been here for about 27 years, 17 of them as full-time. Before that, I was working part-time. And um, in my job, it's very exciting because all the touring shows that come through the Art Center, I interface with all their technical needs and make sure that we have everything set up to their specifications prior to their arrival. For outside groups that rent the theater, I do the same thing. So whether it be something like um, a political debate, which we've had through um, Channel 21, or um, this weekend, for example, the dental hygiene program is doing a lecture um, I, I do all the technical setups and make sure everything happens for those things. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Jason Bowden. I'm the Director of Academic Technologies. I've been here for about, I think this is nine years now, uh, but in my current position for the last uh, three. So I was formerly in the faculty side. In my, in my new position, uh, I'm responsible for making sure we're providing adequate teaching and learning tools for our students and our faculty, uh, room design, uh, as we'll be talking about a little bit later on, accessible technology in our classrooms, uh, and really anything involving teaching and learning tools or software. Very good. Well, thank you all. Obviously, you are looking at many of the foundation board members, and I know you were prepped, so you, you know who these individuals are. So what I'd like to do is the topic, as you know, is talking about the funding of your projects. So what the board would like to do is find out what was the project, what was it like before, and more importantly, what was it like after you received foundation dollars? Project, before, and after. And again, it's free-flowing, so anyone can start. Like Jason can start. All right. <laughs> I would love to volunteer to start. So uh, I, I think, like a lot of people uh, on this end of the table today, the Hack Foundation has actually generously supported a number of our initiatives. Uh, we've been very, very fortunate to, to work with that organization. Uh, it ranges. So uh, one is the new technology for our award-winning uh, graphic design program. That was a recent project. If you have time today, Hall Tech 222. Beautiful space. Uh, really improved the, the educational experience there for our faculty and students. Uh, it ranges from that to student tools like the One Button Studio. That's actually over in Whitaker right now if you want to go take a look at one of those. Uh, and what does that mean, Jason? For those that may yeah, not be familiar, so, what does one button mean? Yeah, so one button studio is uh, targeting students uh, making videos is our primary audience. So our students are trying to uh, do more creative assessments. A number of our faculty are working <laughs> on meeting learning outcomes, not just through the, the kind of traditional uh, drill and quiz and essay format, but through kind of how do you illustrate learning using, say, video, uh, creating presentations, how do you assess those learning outcomes that require interpersonal engagement? And we didn't really have a way for students to capture that easily. It required them to have a recording studio or go to a recording studio or figure out 
sometimes complicated software to create and edit these things. The One Button Studio is really aiming at making that, as the name says, a one button solution. You go in with a flash drive, plug in your flash drive, you hit a button, a recording starts. You do your presentation, you may have something up on the projector behind you, and when you're done, you hit the button again, and you walk out of there with something that you can then hand into your class, whether that's online through our LMS or in your face-to-face -face <coughs> class. Just on learning the management drive. system. Yes, learning, sorry, my acronyms, I'll, I'll make sure I spell those out. Uh, learning <laughs> management system, our LMS. Uh, and the one I'll probably be talking most about for, for this is uh, our accessibility consultant that we were able to, to work in the Hack Foundation to bring in a little while back. Uh, before that, uh, it was really kind of a, an area of uncertainty. When we talked about increasing accessibility at Hack, it wasn't really a, an issue of will, right? Everybody was on board with the mission. How do we make our learning more accessible? How do we make our institution across the board more accessible? The challenge was we would ask those questions, but we didn't know how to answer them. So we would ask the how, the how can we, let's do this, but we didn't, we didn't know what we didn't know. So we were able to work with the Hack Foundation to secure funding to bring in an accessibility consultant who works specifically with higher education. Uh, and actually Teresa was mm -hmm. a, a participant in that kind of across the board, institution-wide, evaluating some of our practices uh, and laying out a plan so not just providing us with, oh, hey, here's what, what you could be doing, but specific steps that we could start implementing, ways that we can make progress on that. Uh, so what does that look like afterward? We've continued to work on that plan. Uh, we've continued to knock some of those, those elements out. One that my group is very much involved in is our classroom technology, and how do we make that more accessible? So we now have a classroom technology standard. All of the campuses are now installing classrooms for our general purpose classes that match. They're all the same. And we have taken steps with the feedback from that consultant to make sure that our new interactive whiteboards are at an accessible height so that faculty members who may have a wheelchair, they can still use those boards. They're not out of reach. They don't lose functionality in the classrooms. They can still teach their students. Their students still get that experience. Uh, we're also working now with a lot more digital technology. So we're able to take the signal from the whiteboard in the classroom and send it out to student devices. So if a student has a visual need and they need that a little bit closer to them, we can actually deliver that to their iPad, <coughs> to their phone. That's a small form factor, but students today love it, <laughs> love their phone, and we can deliver the content to them digitally. Uh, it will also allow us, as we move forward, so for next steps, uh, working more with audio. How do we take that audio signal and deliver that directly to, say, someone's assistive hearing device so that they are able to hear that lecture as though it's a conversation right in front of them rather than kind of at the back of the classroom. So yeah, we're very excited at everything the Hack Foundation's provided for that and we're continuing to move forward with that afterward. Any specific questions of Jason? All right, let's Thank continue you. on. Whoever else? I can go next. Um, so I received the <coughs> Travel Award um, and that was to fund a trip to Las Vegas to the Live Design International Convention. Um, the last time I had gone to that convention was the year 2000, so <laughs> it had been a while. Um, and one of the things that um, Rich Cardamon had asked for is the idea of a self-operating theater. So um, he wanted to know how could we make the theater space more user-friendly for people to be able to just walk in and have an event without the need for technicians. Um, so that was primarily the equipment I was looking at was how to make that happen. And it was interesting because I found a lot of equipment to make that happen that really wasn't what I expected. Um, most of the equipment in the theater today was installed in 1993, so it's not real current, <laughs> but it all works. And to make it so that it's networkable is a lot, it's gonna cost a significant amount of money, but I actually found a lot of ways that we could get around that, and there's a lot of things that are actually on the cusp of being invented right now that will enable you to use your cell phone, for example, to control the lights and the sound, which I think is the step we want to wait for, rather than putting in a whole system that then has like a symposium or a podium that has controls on it. I think it would just, you know, it would be much more affordable because we would not have to replace absolutely everything in the room. So that was great, but also, um, since I work with students, I was looking at a lot of the projection technology 
which the theater department is very interested in starting to implement into the performances that they do. Um, so I was able to like hands-on go and look at like five different companies that offer that technology and really make a recommendation to them as to the one that I personally felt was the best and it was very clear to me. So actually being able to go there, um, there's over 350 Tech, like technical theater companies that are at that convention. It's only held in Las Vegas, so it's kind of where you have to go in order to find that information. And um, so to me, it was just very valuable to go there. Thank you. Are you in order? <laughs> so as the chair of English, I'm confident saying that English is the superior academic discipline. <laughs> and the reason, though, is that we focus on plot, character, and motivation. Envision a time in your life when those things were not at play. Plot, character, and motivation are involved in every interpersonal situation. And so as the chair of English, I am gratified to live in my natural habitat, which is leveraging the narrative and symbolism as a means of achieving ends on behalf of our students and the faculty and the institution. So in my first year as chair, I engaged in a listening tour with the adjunct and full-time faculty and thought about the narrative that would develop in our first year under my leadership. And the narrative that developed was under the theme of equity. And so we engaged in some big projects to promote equity, specifically for students, as we engaged in a review of every textbook in our curriculum, which is over 500, by the way to ensure that those materials were available to students in a variety of formats independent of their uh, disability qualification. So a student wouldn't have to pursue accommodations if she wanted a digital textbook or an audio textbook. So on the student side, we focused on equity in our materials. On the faculty side, we focused on equity for our adjunct faculty members who carry 70% of our instructional load in English. One of the things I heard very clearly early on from our adjunct faculty is that they didn't feel reflected in the business of the department. And in fact, we didn't have a structure to allow them to vote on our departmental matters, despite the fact that they are in front of a good number of our students. So we worked on a structure to provide voting rights for that block of faculty and successfully implemented that for the department. And the Hatch Foundation, so that was a symbolic effort, as I see it, um, to include those voices. Uh, but also a practical effort. And the other practical effort was supported by the Hack Foundation, and that was the adjunct research stipends, where I requested a small amount of money to provide tangible material support for those faculty members who are so critical to the mission, not only of our department and our disciplines in the English department, but to the institution, so that those faculty could apply for financial support uh, in support of research they were conducting that they then shared with the full-time faculty and anyone else who attended our week zero meeting in August. So we had some great results from that. I'll highlight one, which was the significance of short writing assignments in the context of a composition class. One of the things I tell my own students is that if you can sustain an argument for three pages, you can do it for five, you can do it for 10. If you can do it for 10, you can do it for 50. So I don't need to burden you in Comp 101 with a 20-page paper if I can see you sustain an argument in three or five pages. So the presentation that we heard from uh, Ty Cleaver, an adjunct faculty member at York, helped inspire the faculty to think a little bit differently about how we engage with our students in the context of composition. So we are greatly appreciative of those funds to support those adjunct faculty and really make them feel included and a part of the English department. So thank you for that. And um, in terms of workforce development, when I was asked to present on this panel, I had a difficult time focusing in on one project because the foundation has been so generous and instrumental in funding many projects for workforce development. Since I've been here in my short tenure of three years, um, multiple requests have gone to the foundation in, I would say, I would characterize them in two categories, equipment and um, fiscal support for our debt subsidy. So in terms of equipment, um, many of our pieces of equipment were outdated, meaning uh, high maintenance costs, outdated technology. So when you're training students on that type of technology, they're not getting the best that's out there. Um, we want to train our students so that they're prepared 
to be the best employees for employers when it comes time for them to hiring them. And sometimes we're training actual employees of companies. So training on outdated equipment, there's breakdowns, which means you can't hold your class, you have to rent equipment, whatever the case may be. So training on outdated equipment was a struggle for us um, before the Hack Foundation helped us support some of those um, equipment um, projects. Some of them purchasing recently will be purchasing a fire truck. They've purchased an ambulance. Uh, a CPR van for transporting mannequins. A CDL truck is out for bid as of today. Um, a telehandler, life pack man monitors and computers for two of our areas are just some of the equipment that have been funded by the foundation over this last few years that I've been here. The other area where we've struggled in the past has been to pay back the debt that is owed on the public safety center. Um, the foundation has been generous in also supporting us with that. So there were many years, um, when I say the project before that, where workforce development struggled to balance its budget. When I first started, um, I looked back 10 years, which was back to 2007 at the time. There was one year in that period of time where workforce development had ended the year in the black, and that was in 2008. So before the project, many struggles for us as a unit. After the project, um, we are so thankful for all of these equipment pieces that you've helped us to purchase. Um, recently, you've purchased computer lab, mobile computer uh, computers that we can take to different trainings. So we're using them now currently in our IMT, Industrial Manufacturing Technician Apprenticeship Program. We have two cohorts that are soon to um, graduate, one in December, one in January. I think those are the dates. Um, being able to take those computers on site to different companies has been helpful for us. Another challenge for us with limited computer space sometimes at the campuses is being able to find a room that's available to consistently have available for us to train with some of our classes. So this has enabled us to set up shop anywhere and have the trainings for that purpose. So that's been extremely helpful to us as well. With that relationship that we have with this one company where we are training their apprentices, um, Vic Rogers, who's the Associate Provost, Provost for Workforce Development and one of our directors, has been invited to Spain, actually upcoming very shortly here, to tour one of the plants, the, the headquarters of one of the plants that we're training for. So that's exciting for us. Hack is being um, mentioned and is traveling around the world. So thank you for your support of that program as well. Um, we recently were able to purchase a telehandler. Um, I'm not sure if all of you know what that piece of equipment is. The allocations committee does because they heard about it before. But it's, it's similar to a forklift uh, on steroids though because it enables, a forklift goes up and down to move, to move items up and down. A uh, telehandler handler moves things up and down but also can project out. So that was a purchase that you generously funded for us as well. Um, the, other, the other neat thing that we're able to do with that, uh, I don't know if you're all familiar with that rubble pile over at the public safety grounds. Um, it, it looks not so pretty, but it, it serves a purpose. It, we use it for search and rescue training. And it's, uh, we are one of three sites in the United States that is an approved training center for FEMA. So it is used heavily for that purpose as well. So thank you for your contribution for that. So with regard to the debt service over uh, your contributions toward that in helping us balance our budget, I'm happy to say for the last three years, workforce development has ended the year in the black. This year is looking to be our best year, but those numbers are not yet audited. So your gifts to workforce development have been instrumental in enabling us to train students on state-of-the-art equipment so that they're training on relevant equipment so that we are preparing our students to serve our employers in the central Pennsylvania region. And you're helping us to um, ensure that we are not a drain on the college, that we are supporting the college and moving the college forward financially as well. So thank you. Last but not least, hopefully. <laughs> uh, the Hack Foundation funded the creation of a new communications hub. And what that is, the Communications Hub is an online application that's used internally by Hack staff to request promotional and marketing materials. And we had an old one that was created many, many years ago, 
It had a lot of bugs and glitches in it. It was using an old programming framework. The code was old. And it was that horrible to use that a lot of people did not want to use it at all. We got a lot of um, complaints about it, a lot of negative comments about it. And what your money did was allowed us to create a new updated version. And the new version <coughs> is streamlined, it's user friendly, it's intuitive, and it's effective. Um, the one thing that we did to help ensure that this was successful was that we completed a significant amount of user testing along the way when we had frameworks we pulled one-on-one -on -one users in and asked them questions and had them actually walk through uh, the framework of the application so it, it's made a big difference and we have a lot of requests and I think it, at our peak times we can have up to 100 requests at any point at any given time. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Paul.